the meandering thoughts of an uneducated, mediocre trier. Embrace all emotions, because one thing is for sure, life will throw everything at you. Remember, there is no happiness without the sad. In order to taste sweetness, one must have dined on bitter. The key is balance. Too much yin will always have to be balanced with yang. So control the yin. I know, easy to say, hard to do. Social media is not real. The world is not populated with smiling models, perfect relationships and shiny happy people. Real life is spotty faces, bad hair days and holes in the big toe position of your socks. Nobody is immune. That swimwear model that you ogled has more issues than you can imagine. Putting yourself in the shop window has no positives. You are seeking other people's approval. Happiness does not lie in the fickle opinion of others, especially strangers. How about seeking your own approval, impressing yourself? Shoulder that rock and start climbing the mountain. How much rock I hear you ask? How much can you handle? Adopt responsibility, shoulder some burden. Each step gained releases that elusive happiness. And happiness is not a guarantee in life. It has to be earned. It is the byproduct of taking control and choosing to move forward with purpose. Let me throw some truth bombs out there. Perfection does not exist, but learn to enjoy the chase anyway. It's one hell of a roller coaster ride that we are blessed to have the chance to experience. Undertake it with gusto. It is the best teacher you will ever have. Professor Experience. Know that self-improvement is the gateway drug to happiness. The only person in that competition is yourself, so in a sense, you can't really lose. Do not compare yourself to others. To do so is to create feelings of lesser or greater. Nobody is superior to you and you shouldn't lord it over anybody else. It is easier said than done, but you need to learn to love yourself warts and all. There is no other you, you are unique. You are the surviving member of a four billion year unbroken chain of life. Those are survival genes in each of your cells. You carry the hopes and dreams of all your ancestors, so persevere forward with pride. Drunk people are not happy. There is a reason they drink too much. All drinkers are escaping something. If you are disputing this point right now, you need to ease off the drink. You are not the exception to the rule and you most certainly do not have it under control. I have found that it's important to learn the difference between real friends and acquaintances. Newsflash. You are not as popular as you think. If you have more than five close friends, I'd wager that they are not all close friends. True friends are rare and few. True friends call merely to say hello with no other agenda. A close friend never gives you rise to question yourself or makes you feel bad. If you feel rivalry, then that is a competitor who wants to beat you. The world is full of those. The old saying is true, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Realise that not everyone has your best interests at heart. So choose your tribe well and of course bring something to the table yourself. Light up the room where possible, but give others the space to do their thing too. Stop talking about yourself so much. If you are interesting, people will ask. Get to know your parents. They won't be around forever. You will learn the reason why you are the way you are. It's like talking to yourself in a way. Wallow in the unconditional love. If you want a life-changing experience, I challenge you to tell them that you love them. Nothing hits home harder, let me tell you. Life is made up of people who have told their parents that they love them and people who want to, or heaven forbid, wish that they had. Paddle in nostalgia, but don't drown in it. 
You have not peaked. You are not on the downhill slide. Your next chapter can easily be your best. Old dogs can indeed learn new tricks. The stupid prick who said they couldn't was an unmotivated fuck who stopped dreaming big and no doubt died choking on his rose-tinted glasses. Pardon my French. I'm looking forward to skydiving in my 80s, running a sub-four-hour marathon in my 90s, marrying a gorgeous gold digger for my 100th birthday. Fingers crossed being saved by science on my deathbed with the discovery of the elixir of the elixir of life and doing a serious Benjamin Button on my second coming. The shackles will be off. Some good advice. How ridiculous is it to enter any debate if you don't know both sides of the argument? The sheer hubris of it. Donald Trump is not all bad. He did some good things. And the left side of the aisle have many admirable qualities too. If you are not able to admit both of these sentences, then you are part of the problem. Always be able to steel man the opposing view and be open to being persuaded. Statistics would suggest that you are not always right. The trend of pitting man against woman as if it's a competition is unhealthy. It's okay to admit that there are differences between the sexes. Our personalities have different preferences but more often than not, that is healthy and complementary. Neither sex is better than the other. What does that mean anyhow? Women are better than men at some things and vice versa. No biggie. We are all equal in the important stuff. All of us are born free and equal in dignity and rights. We are all endowed with reason and conscience and we should return to acting in the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood towards each other. We are not enemies. Men need women, and women need men, and the world needs both. Simples. I think that it's always healthy to remind the intellectual elites in their ivory towers that they did not earn their intelligence. It was pure luck of the draw. Therefore, you should always restrain the urge to insist, you deserve this, you worked hard. It's easy to dominate a race when you are given a head start. And it's easy to work hard when you are equipped with the tools for the job. But when you did nothing to earn these tools, I hope you thank your lucky stars that you were dealt a good hand. These ponderings will make it easier for you to accept high tax for the elites and hopefully allow you to look kinder on the less well-offs. There, for the grace of God, go I and all that. A fear for the next generation. You can mollycoddle too much. Life, love it or hate it, is competition. Life has successes and failures. While we surround our kids with positivity and encouragement, and rightly so, we shield them from failure. We are all winners, mantra. Indeed, in some sense we are, but failure is a learning opportunity. It teaches resilience, stoicism, refocusing, reflection. It helps develop coping mechanisms and strategies. Kids don't keep score in early year sport anymore. And while I understand the arguments for that, without competition, you don't encourage innovation, drive, the search for bigger, faster, stronger, the ability to lose gracefully. Why would one improve themselves if it's not rewarded? Young people are not being allowed to fail, so when life throws a curveball, they are not equipped to handle it. We are playing it too safe. Let young people climb trees, explore, compete. A grazed knee is a rite of passage that has almost gone extinct. Let kids fight their own battles on occasions. Don't underestimate them. Loosen the apron strings. We turned out all right, didn't we? The trend in modern politics to once again focus on immutable characteristics is disappointing to say the least. Dr. King's dream of a colorblind society 
where one is judged not by the colour of their skin but on the content of their character, seems to be fading fast. The world is turning dangerously tribal again. There is a lot of focus on skin colours, gender, sexual orientations. Censorship is making a comeback. History seems destined to repeat itself. We humans, so incredibly ingenious, so predictably fallible. I predict we will bring ourselves to the edge of destruction and then, and only then, at one second to midnight, we will begin to think as one, unite and redeem the situation. Despite our flaws, we are unbelievable creatures. We are the problem, but we are also the solution. Why is it that the Irish love to see each other fail? The good old Irish bitterness. I confess I've dabbled in some schadenfreude myself. It's definitely an insecurity thing. I doubt you would care if you were already successful. Or maybe you would pull up the ladder after you. Should the default position not be, let's all be successful. Alas, success in Ireland necessitates someone else's failure. If we were all millionaires, nobody has won. We need a few people to patronise. Oh, unlucky Johnny. Sorry that didn't work out for you, bud. Better luck next time. That translates as, delight to see you fail, pal. Permission to take a dump on you. And what's up with the preoccupation with money? It has become life's goal. To be rich is to have made it. My, my, we have strayed off the path of righteousness, eh? I recommend for everybody to take a walk in the uncontacted tribesman's proverbial shoes, as he is probably barefoot. They have no concept of money, yet their purpose is no less legitimate than ours. It would be fascinating to try and measure who is the more content, the tribesman or the CEO. An interesting thought occurs to me. The tribesman appears to be more congruent with the world and nature than does the CEO. Modern man, in my opinion, grows more alien and removed from nature as time progresses. Is that positive or negative? Here would be an intriguing study. If I gave you the choice between being rich, successful, famous, but unhappy, or living as a hunter-gatherer, unknown outside your tribe, but you are unbelievably happy, what would you choose? Money and success is very tempting, isn't it? The weird cult of celebrity never ceases to amaze me. You can be famous for nothing bar appearing on TV, which strangely imbues the wannabe with a superiority complex and the conviction that their opinion is now super valuable. Why do we place actors and actresses on the podium? I suppose it sums up modern society nicely. Our heroes pretend to be other people for a living. This evokes worship, not too short of idolatry. Reality check people. Intellectuals actually dream of being doctors, lawyers, chemists, scientists. If you could have any skill or talent in the world, what would you choose? The virtuous answer would be, I suppose, something like wanting to be a skilled surgeon, to heal people, or to be an influential politician to try and solve the world's conflicts. Indeed, yes, but I am not virtuous. I am riddled with a disease called selfishness. When it flares up, I can't see anybody else bar myself, which is okay, because I am my own biggest fan. But when I have it in mild doses, I'm at least able to acknowledge other people in the room. My condition allows me to want to be a singer of no benefit to anyone bar myself, apt. A beautifully egotistical transaction. I sing, they lavish praise. Simples. Alas, be infinitely grateful that I can't sing. I would be a nightmare if I could. A diva on steroids. 
I'd never shut up. I'd sing at the drop of a hat. I can picture myself serenading the coffin at a wake. Chief mourner, crying on the body as I held the last note like my life depended on it. Shaking everybody's hand like I'd sang the body into heaven. Thanking everybody and secretly getting my next tune lined up. I regret to say, I don't think that I'd be generous with the stage. Any rival singers would be met with a sonic warning harmony before I dropped into the singer's melody range and drowned him out with my superior dulcet tones. Patting him on the shoulder with a thanks for warming them up pal and a little wink. If he was stupid enough to try and harmonise with me, I would change the lyrics to stop please you're killing it while looking him dead in the eye. I'd probably take up God worship again, just so I could sing in the church. I'd go full electric with drums and wear a leather frock with a cross back patch. I'd sing life into those old hymns. A bit of vibrato and vocal gymnastic never hurt anyone. And tears would be expected. Holy tears. It's taken for granted that I'd accompanied the priest with some a cappella over his communion chants, just to liven them up a bit. If the Holy Spirit fills me and the crowd are with me, I intend to break into spontaneous Gregorian chant. I'll sing a line and then get the congregation to sing a response. I'll go heavy with the smoke machine at that point too, to create the Holy Ghost effect. I'll not unleash the strobe until the blessing after communion. It'll be like God has entered the building and is speaking in thunder. A bit like Thor. Yeah, like I said, it's a fortunate thing that I can't sing. I'd be absolutely insufferable. But joking aside, to have a singing ability is some gift. A voice that grabs the attention of the whole room is spine tingling. It's rare, but absolutely wonderful. I have two mates who are of that ilk. Lead singers are a unique breed. They live by different rules. They are actually qualified to knock other voices. <laughs> and boy, do they. Lead singers hate most singers outside of the singers of their favorite groups. It's pure alpha male stuff. I always joke to the two lads that if I had their voices that I'd be famous. Getting in the sly dig that talent also needs hard work. Their talent was so effortless that I often seen people move to tears when they sang. I joke you not. The connection between the singer and the audience is palpable and undeniable. You can feel something floating in the air. The room dims to silence as the huge voice captivates the room, commanding attention and bringing focus to the lyrics. The air vibrates and everybody dissolves into the moment. I am always moved and absolutely purely jealous. It's truly a superpower. A funny aside, the clever boys used to get yours truly here to warm up the crowd and sing a song first. The Shane McGowan before the Eddie Vedder, if you will. Me convinced, of course, that I was the Eddie Vedder. I told you, I'd be a bloody nightmare. My relationship with sport is love-hate. My dad, I hugely admire him for this. He allowed me to chase the sports dream despite knowing its futility. His biggest gift to us was always encouraging us to dream big. And I still do. But sport can be a destroyer as much as it is a builder. I was very naive about sport. I thought that hard work could bridge the gaps up to my rivals. This is not true. You are born with a certain speed and ability and that's it. You can hone it, but can't improve on it. It's all down to your basic speed. I can tell your potential by seeing your 100 meter 200 meter and 400 meter times. Even if you run the marathon, you have to be lightning quick. And I wasn't. 
I was good in Ireland, poor internationally. Dream over. Now deal with that realisation. A confidence wallop to shatter your whole identity, if ever there was one. It still puts manners on me today when I recall it. I still compete. I can't remember at this stage if I was ever any good at all, to be honest. I managed to get somewhat fit for two weeks every year. Two glorious weeks where I relive my glory years and I'm a contender again, not just making up the numbers. I often reflect on who it is that I'm trying to impress. I definitely am hugely influenced by my brother Shane, a force of nature, and a whole psychological case study by himself. He doesn't know when to call it a day, and he has me believing that we can turn back time. He lives for proving people wrong, and he infects me with it. It's very contagious. Opening cans of whoop-ass and hand-delivering I told you so's is undoubtedly a big motivation for us. My food addiction and thus my fat cunt disorder is my Achilles heel. If I cut myself I would bleed taco chips from Mama's Pizzeria. Being fat and running are allergic to each other. They shouldn't mix. Lycra and man boobs should be illegal. I can see that this neck thought is absolutely insane, but Jesus, sometimes I wish I was bulimic, but I'll tell you, my body wouldn't part with the food. It would help if I could fast forward past the times of seven o'clock to nine o'clock every night. This is when I'm vulnerable. The final nail in my coffin was the development of the Just Eat app on your mobile phone. Heroin for fat people. With two or three mashes of my fat fingers on the keypad and the food is magically on the way. Shamefully, I pretend that I'm ordering for two. I don't elaborate. If they know that I live alone, I let on that I'm ordering for the next two days. The excitement after the phone call is made is akin to a kid waiting to watch the RT toy show. Time stops. A watched menu never delivers, a wise man once said. Or should have anyway. On the arrival, I play cool at the door. I don't want them to think that I'm a food junkie. Any attempt at small talk is cut short with a firm bag grab and a thank you good luck. The taco fry is one of the wonders of the modern world. It's a meal that makes you feel dirty, like you're having an affair or something. It's lower class food. If it was to appear in a Michelin star restaurant, it would have to be snuck in under a pseudonym. Taco Bellissimo del Fritto, and accompanied by an exorbitant price. But worth it, tis good shit, as they say in the local chipper. Before I eat le taco, I put my brain in my back pocket. If I did not disconnect it, the calories in the taco would cause my brain to overload and a food coma would be induced. I also start my timer. The taco is clever. It tries to protect itself by coagulating into a tough but not impossible to eat block. You have approximately 12 minutes to consume the delicacy before solidification sets in. The likelihood is that as you are consuming the taco, that you will fall into a deep ta taco frenzy. You may not even be aware of your surroundings even. 12 minutes will elapse quickly. If the taco solidifies, desist from eating the block of taco like a Mars bar. Chipped teeth would be a certainty. I am not brave enough to talk about the rancidity of a taco number two toilet break. It is recommended one dons a hazmat suit before you attempt bowel movement seemingly. And obviously clear the building first. Expect a 30 foot blast zone. So to conclude, my running dream is still alive but hindered by my weakness for food. 
a skinny me would roll back the years. Next season, maybe. By the way, the lads nicknamed me Chunky. It hurts, but I accept it like a good victim. I deserve it. I hate myself. <laughs> Only joking. Tackles are strong, but they're not that bloody strong. I will end on the random note of my fascination with the late, great Seamus Heaney. I'm in awe of the man. I don't claim to understand all his works. Some I just roll off the tongue, enjoying the sound. He oozes intellect and his command of English is intimidating. He makes me proud to be Irish and proud that he's one of us. He makes me feel quite stupid, which is quite hard to do. He couples words together that are so unlikely yet brilliant. Does he obey the rules? Invents the rules more like. After being a singer, I think I'd enjoy being a first-rate poet. Alas, language and English do not come easily to me. I feel very inarticulate, limited in my vocab and very basic. It's like language is out of my control. Seamus, on the other hand, he has tamed the language. It does his bidding, and I salute you, Mr. Heaney. At least you've inspired me to write. Although I'd say some condemn you for that, unfortunately. P.S. Another condition that I've infected over the years is this awful dose of overconfidence. And I also caught a severe case of inflated ego. The doctor says it's incurable, but I assured him I could find a cure. Mix some charlatan with a dash of fraud and sprinkle in a pinch of delusion. That would work all right. But it might dull my overflowing creativity. So I'll wait till I get writer's block and then I'll swallow the medicine. Hopefully it'll be gone off by then. PPS. And this is important. On rereading this with sober eyes and ears, I had to turn off my cringe meter because it was peaking. I think the consumption of vino is obvious throughout. Starting with a serious tone and slowly metamorphosing, if that's how you pronounce it, into the drunk uncle with his stories that were best left untold. As well as being unhappy, trunks are truly unfunny, but full of confidence. The confidence of a drunk, if bottled and sold, would cure the world's anxiety. Now there's a pitch for Dragon's Den. <laughs> <laughs>